Good morning. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us here this morning on our online worship service. And as we prepare our hearts for service this morning, I'd ask that you bow with me in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for the promise that where two or three are gathered, you are there in the midst. Lord, we welcome you to be among us today. And we celebrate the gift of life that you have lavished upon each of us. We ask that you would open our ears so that we may hear your voice, Lord. Open our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom. Open our spirits so that we may know your leading and guidance. And open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love, Lord. We ask all of this in the glorious name of our Savior. Jesus Christ. Let us all say, Amen. He's able, he's able, he's able, he's able. My God is more than able. My God is able, say that. He's able, he's able, he's able, he's able, he's able, he's able. My God, my God is more than able. Come on, some brothers and say, More than able. Jesus. Name, Lord Jesus. 
smile on me. He's been good. He's been good. So good to me. Let's sing it again. God has smiled. God has smiled. Yes, he has smiled. smiled on me. He has said, set me free from my burdens and sins. God. to me his amazing grace amazing grace how sweet the sound saved a wretch like me I once was lost oh but now I'm found Lord thank God I can see it's all because God Oh my God has smiled on me He has, he has set me, me free From my burdens and sins God, God has Oh yes on me. He's been good, yeah He's been good, He's been good yes He's been He's been, has he been good to you? He's been God has been good to me. He's been yes, he has. He set me free, Lord. He's been, God has been good, Lord. He's been good, so good to me. As we continue with our worship, please join us in prayer. Lord, we come before you today to give you honor and praise. You are worthy of our praise. You are the source of all that is good. You are the source of all of our blessings. Forgive us for our sins and cleanse our hearts of sinful thoughts and intent as we enter into your presence with praise. Lord, we give thanks for every gift that we have been given, for helping us to accomplish our work week, and for your plans for us this week, for Jesus and the sacrifice he made on the cross to save us, and for the gift of your spirit to guide us, for the opportunity of being together this day. We ask for your hand of blessing on this assembly. Lord, we pray on behalf of people who have lost, who are lost and are in need of you of members who are sick or weak, and those who need help from you, of families who have suffered the loss of a loved one. Lord, we request of you to give us strength to serve you. Give us more knowledge about you. Grant your presence today and guide and direct our worship so that it is full of wisdom, reverence of your presence, and respect for one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We now prepare our hearts to commemorate the work of our Savior at Calvary. As hosts, please allow your participants to obtain the communion items they have provided for themselves in preparation for taking communion. We ask you now to give your attention to the unleavened bread. Please remove the bread from the container and hold it in your hand. With this bread, we are reminded of the sinless sacrifice of our Savior. His sacrifice established this fellowship of believers. By partaking of this unleavened bread, we are to be reminded to keep our relationships with each other pure. The Apostle Paul says, Let us keep the feast, not with the leaven of wickedness and malice, 
but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let us give thanks for the bread. Father, we thank you for this reminder that our relationship with each other is to be without wickedness and malice. In Jesus' name, amen. You may now eat the bread. We now ask you to prepare to partake of the cup. Please peel back the cover. With this cup, we focus on the blood sacrifice that enables us to have fellowship with Christ. When we partake, we declare that we have been forgiven of our sins and have been brought into union with him and his purpose for our lives. Let us give thanks for the cup. Father, we thank you for this reminder of the blood sacrifice that brings us into fellowship with your son. In Jesus' name we give thanks. Amen. You may now partake of the cup. You may pause this video at this time in preparation for giving. Struggles in the 
We now prepare to worship our Lord through our giving. Just as in communion, our giving involves two kinds of responses. Our first response is an acknowledgement of the income that God has provided us to meet our daily needs. By faith, we return to him a just representation of the regular income, which is called the tithe. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness in meeting our daily needs and for giving us the power to gain wealth. We acknowledge your faithfulness to us by our giving of the tithe and for the support of this ministry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome you to another online service of the Receda Boulevard Church of Christ in which we are fulfilling our mission of bringing life to the world. We have prepared a special series of messages for uh, helping you to deal with this pandemic and the challenges of faith that this pre pandemic presents us with. And this series is entitled Faith That Works in Difficult Times. The principles comes out of the book of James who's writing to a group of people who are experiencing a similar crisis. In our last lesson, we came to the fifth chapter of the book of James where James addresses the issue of the restorative or healing powers associated with living faith. And uh, the text that we addressed literally has a word uh, that gives us two particular emphasis as it relates to the concept of healing. 
and that is the word esteneo, which uh, is a word for strength. And with the alpha in the front, it negates the idea of strength, which the two emphasis is having to do with weakness versus illnesses. Uh, that is, faith is faith empowers our weaknesses as well as it restores us from our illnesses. Today's focus, we're going to deal with faith that restores the sick. We dealt with weaknesses last week, and this week we're going to deal with uh, the issue of healing. Uh, that is faith as it relates to healing our sicknesses. Uh, we need to understand that physical healing was a major part of the ministry of Jesus. In Matthew 4 and verse 23, uh, the Bible says that Jesus went everywhere teaching and preaching and healing people who had all kinds of disease and sicknesses. So we learned that Jesus was not only a teacher, he was a preacher and a healer. Uh, that is one third of his ministry was about healing. It had to do with health care. And this is why one of the major focuses of Christianity historically has been health care. Uh, many may not realize that it is the Christian church uh, the Christian church in the second century that founded hospitals during the plague associated with uh, Anto Antonin, the Antonian plague of the second century, and also the Cyprian plague of the third century, uh, this same emphasis in hospitals uh, was strengthened. And so the church, Christian church, has been responsible historically, not only for hospitals, but even in the establishment of many schools. Uh, the whole idea of education is grounded, you know, in historical Christianity. We need to understand, as it relates to this subject matter we're dealing with today, that God is the source of all means of healing, whether it be healing by uh, by the hands of a doctor or by taking medicine or uh, natural herbs and this type of thing, all forms of healing, God is the source of our healing. But before we deal with the biblical text of James 5 and the power associated, you know, with healing as it relates to our faith, I want you, I want to address three mistaken views about divine healing, three myths associated with healing that we are confronted with in our world today. The first myth or the first error is that the notion I can buy my healing by giving. Need you to understand that this isn't true. One cannot bribe or bargain with God. Everything that God does, he does it out of his graciousness. He does it out of his character of love. We see this false notion uh, put forth even in the Middle Ages uh, through what was called the sale of indulgences, where believers were encouraged to buy the right to commit a sin. And as a result, they would be covered if anything happened in the commission of this sin or crime, they would be covered. All they needed to do in order to gain this indulgence, you know, was to donate money to the building fund of the church, which was at that time, uh, the St. Peter's uh, Basilica in Rome was being built mainly by the sale of indulgences. It was this teaching that actually sparked the Protestant Reformation movement. One of the major reasons or uh, catalysts for the Protestant Reformation was the sale of indulgences. Now, this is this is something that's perennial because even today, you know, preachers not are not peddling uh, paying for your salvation, but they're peddling healing. Therefore, there are these preachers who refer to themselves as healers uh, and they sell you the the Christian good or the good of healing uh, by having you to purchase, you know, prayer clause. They tell you if you send me a certain amount of money, you send, you know, this particular donation, you know, we will send you in, a, in return a prayer cloth or some special oil or special water that was transported from the Holy Land in exchange. And as a result of these trick of these items, you can receive healing. I want you to understand that this is biblically uh, just not true. You know, and of course, this is this is a notion that was also a part. Uh, we can read about this even in the New Testament. That was a gentleman by the name of Simon the Sorcerer. Uh, 
he was a man, the Bible says in Acts the eighth chapter, you know, uh, that was a man named Simon who used magic tricks for many years to pose as a miracle worker. He amazed everybody and he claimed supernatural powers. He had a large following of people and they called him the great power. Uh, but when Philip preached Jesus in his town, Simon himself believed and he was later baptized. Then uh, the text goes on to say later on, when Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was imparted through the land of the apostles hands, he offered them money to buy this power. You know, but notice Peter said, you and your money will end up in hell if you think God's gift can be bought. Your heart is not right before God, before God. Uh, therefore, turn from this wicked attitude and pray and ask God to forgive you for trying to use God to make money. There are those who are guilty of this same sin today. As a matter of fact, you know what the Bible teaches about the apostasy of the Christian faith. That is the falling away from from a Christian truth uh, that would occur historically in Christianity. According to first Peter, much of that would be associated, you know, with covetousness. That is making merchandise out of people and and the peddling of of religious are Christian goods. Notice in 2 Corinthians, the second chapter in verse 17, Paul says, unlike so many others, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. Now, one might ask, well, what about these, these so-called healers and, and this type of thing? Are these people saved? Are they Christians? You know, well, you know, God will determine that. But notice in Matthew 7 and verse 22, the Bible says these words, Jesus says on the day of judgment, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Did we not give out, uh, did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not perform many miracles in your name? And then I will say to them, no, I never knew you and you have never been mine. Go away from me. Uh, your word was evil. You know, so the point is uh, many of what we're seeing, you know, in scripture, the, in other words, the scripture teaches us, you know, that one cannot purchase. You need to understand that healing uh, cannot be purchased with money. Here's the second error and myth we need to uh, expose. And that is the notion that it is never God's will for me to be sick. You know, there are those who advocate that sickness is always due to sin or the lack of faith. You know, that is, if you're sick, it's your own fault because it is never, according to them, it is never God's will for me to be sick. Now, this is a teaching that comes mainly, you know, from preachers that are referred to as health, wealth and prosperity preachers. You know, but the problem with this is that the Bible teaches the exact opposite. The Bible teaches us that God uses problems and pain and suffering in our lives. It's a part of God's discipline process in terms of building Christ like character. We even see that God didn't even exempt Jesus from this process of character development. Notice in Hebrews five, verse eight, the Bible said, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered and then being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. So the point is, the Bible said Jesus learned obedience by the things that he suffered. You know, there are many scriptures to consider uh, uh, about this particular issue. Notice uh, what Jesus said in John 16 and verse 33. Jesus says, in the world, you will have trouble. You know, in this world, you're going to have trouble. This is a broken world and you're not going to get through this world, you know, without being impacted, you know, by brokenness. Notice in Philippians one and verse twenty nine, Paul says this, for you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. So the point is, it's just a part of God's will. It's a part of our calling as believers, you know, to be identified with Christ, not only, you know, in terms of putting our faith in him, but be ide being identified with his ministry and his suffering. Notice in Colossians, Paul makes this very clear. In Colossians 1 and verse 24, the Bible said, Paul says, there are things that Christ still suffers through his body, the church. And Paul says, I am accepting in my body 
my part of these things that must be suffered. The point is, Paul is saying we we still fulfill in our body the sufferings of Christ for his body's sake, which is the church. Now, notice in First Thessalonians three and verse three, uh, Paul makes it very clear. He says, look, we don't want you to become unsettled. That is, don't get blown away, you know, by these trials that he that he's talking about in this text. He says, you know uh, quite well that we were destined for them. So the point is, uh, it is a part of our destiny, you know, to suffer and to experience pain, you know, for the sake of, of, of our Lord. And then here's the third issue that we need to clear, clear up before we get into this text. And that is the notion that divine healing or even faith healing is the same as miraculous healing. You know, that was in uh, the early church, what is called the miraculous gift of healing. You know, that is the apostles uh, who had this gift perform miracles such as healing as sign miracles, signs that confirm, you know, the revelation of the uh, Christian faith, the revelation of the word of God. It was confirmed, you know, and signs of the kingdom, the advent of the kingdom and the miracle uh, gift associ was associated as a sign that showed that the kingdom of God would be about healing. And so it is it is a erroneous assumption to assume uh, that God is no longer in the healing business. Now, of course, those who try to relate divine healing with miraculous healing, you know, they usually quote Hebrews 13 and verse eight, where uh, the Hebrew writer says Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. And that's supposed to assume that whatever God has done in the past, he continued to do that same thing in the same way in the future. But I simply remind you and simply rebut that point by simply saying that that God once made a man that never was a boy, and he's not doing that today. So the point is, God used the supernatural gift of healing as a sign miracle uh, as it relates to the kingdom to show that the kingdom would be in the healing business. But you need to understand that God does not need to perform a miracle in order to heal or in order to bring about restoration and health to you. You know, he doesn't. Miracles were simply God suspending the laws of creation and all contingencies intervening into creation to bring about a, a end result. You know, but understand this. When we talk about divine healing, it just simply means through faith, all divine resources are made available, you know, to bring about what God's will is. So divine healing is simply God making all resources, you know, of healing available to the believer, whether it be doctors, hospitals, medicine, herbs, or even the power of faith that and its psychosomatic effect and impact on the body. God can use all these as resources to bring about his will. So don't mistake, you know, the miraculous gift of healing with divine healing because they are not necessarily synonymous. Both are divine, but God used uh, miracles in a special way, you know, to, for establishing the kingdom and establishing divine revelation. Now, what I need you, what we want to do is to understand the text. I want to read this text that we're going to do and things are going to go pretty rapidly at this point. You know, as we deal with James 5, 13 to 18, James says this, are you hurting? He said, then you should pray. Are you happy? Then you should sing songs of praise. He said, are you sick? Then you should call the church elders to pray over you and anoint you with all in the name of our Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will heal the sick person. The Lord will raise him up. And if you have sinned, you'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your faults to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a believing person is powerful and effective. He said, for example, Elijah was a human being just like us. Yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, he said, so there was no rain three and a half years. Then he prayed that it would rain and it poured down and everything began to grow again. Now, that's a very powerful uh, passage of scripture, you know, and it's a passage of hope because it says this. He says, Elijah prayed and everything began growing again. You know, we need that kind of healing. 
We need healing in so many different ways. You know, especially during this pandemic, there are people who are seeking financial healing. When we look at our culture, the larger culture, there needs to be cultural healing. When we look at the nation and what we're going through, even with the election, there needs to be national healing. You know, so we need healing in so many ways. And it is the prayer, you know, that we should be praying, you know, that everything will begin to grow again. You know, I want you to note also in this passage, in the six verses, the passage mentions prayer seven times. And what is the point? The point is that healing comes through prayer. It doesn't come through faith healers. It doesn't come through healers. It comes through prayer. The passage answers four questions that we want to address at this time. And that is number one, when should I pray for healing? The second question of the text is why aren't people healed every time we pray? You know, that's a legitimate question. And we want to address that, you know, as we deal with principles of this text. And then the third principle, the third question would be, who can pray for healing? And the last question is, how do I pray for healing for myself and for others? So let's deal with these four questions on faith that brings healing uh, for the sick. Now, notice the first question. When should I pray for healing? There are four specific times, according to this passage, to pray for healing. Now, the answer to the question actually relates to four different words that are actually used in this text. Notice the first question James asks. He says, are you hurting? That's cock. That's kako patheo, which simply means having trouble, uh, suffering. He's saying, are you having trouble? Are you hurting? Are you suffering? The second question, he says, are you sick? And we dealt with this word, estheneo, which means feeling weak or sick. You know, that's a different word. You know, and he says, if you are sick, you know, are you hurting? Are you sick? And then the third the third principle is, he says, he re- identifies the sick person. He refers to the sick person as camno, which means weary, a person that's weary, a person that feels like giving up. You know, that's the that's the uh, meaning associated with that word, the sick person. And then the last part of the text uh, indicates no rain for three and a half years. It refers to a drought or a dry spell uh, that may be occurring in your circumstance or in your life. So the answer to the question is simply this. You know, anytime I'm hurting, sick, tired or feeling empty, that is a calling to pray. It dis- and it may describe the totality of your life. You may say, Brother Winrow, look, I'm hurting, sick and tired and I'm feeling and I'm really feeling empty. You know, well, you know, this is the time to ask God to bring restoration to your life. So that's the answer to the first question. Now, the second question is, why aren't people healed every time? You know, of course, the simple answer to this question is simply this. You know, we don't know God's will. You know, our desires, we pray according to our desires. And that is, but sometimes our desires all does not always align, align, uh, align with God's will. You know, God answers every prayer. He may say, he may answer affirmatively. He may may say no. uh, He may say wait. Or he may say, you can't be kidding. You have to be kidding. But the point is, God answers all prayers. You know, but we need to understand that there are times uh, that God uses illness in our lives. He sometimes allows illness. Now, there are various reasons for this, but let me just offer you three reasons, you know, from the word of God that's very clear in terms of how God can allow you to experience illness, you know, in your life. Number one, God sometimes allows illness in my life to get my attention and to redirect me. Notice Psalms 119, verse 71. The Bible says it was good. The psalmist says it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. You know, sometimes God has to put us flat on our back in order to get us to look up. You know, so many times change often occur in people's lives, not when they uh, simply see the light, but when they feel the heat. Notice in Proverbs 20 and verse 30, you know, the the, uh, wise man says, sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. So the point is, God often uses Uh, God may use illness in your life to get your attention and to redirect you. This kind of sickness is called 
uh, sickness for training or sickness for discipling purposes. God can use pain and suffering in your life as a means of discipling you. Now, notice in uh, another reason that God may allow sickness in your life, and that is to be a testimony for others. Do you not know that God knows if he can trust you with an illness uh, and whether or not you'll be a good example? And sometimes God knows that and he would allow you to experience, you know, sickness for simply the purpose of testifying or witnessing to others. Philippians 1 and verse 12, the Bible says, Paul says, I want you to know, uh, dear brothers, brothers and sisters, that what happened to me has helped spread the good news. Now, Paul was in prison when he wrote this, and Paul was also ill, according to the Philippian correspondence. And he is saying that what has happened to him has happened for the spread of the good news. Sometimes your greatest witness and sometimes the greatest witness to unbelievers is the example of how you handle pain in your life. You need to understand that Christians are not exempt from problems. We experience what everybody else, what all others experience, but we have a power that comes from our relationship to Christ. We have the power of the indwelling spirit, a power to comfort us and to give us hope and to give us wisdom. And so that's a difference, you know, in how we manage uh, pain and suffering in our lives. You know, this kind of illness Keep in mind, is referred to as a sickness to the glory of God. Notice what Jesus said re regarding the illness of, of his friend Lazarus in, in John 11 and verse 4. He said, this sickness will not end in death. It is an illness for the glory of God to, uh, to bring glory to the Son of God. So the point is, God can use illness to get your attention. He can also use illness as a means of bringing him glory. And he can also understand, use illness as a means of transition. You know, that is to take us into eternity. Do you not know this is often referred to as a sickness that leads to death? You're going to leave here with something, you know. And so, you know, you have to prepare the, for the fact, you know, that this tabernacle that we deserve, that we are presently living in is going to eventually be dissolved. It decays day by day. The Bible says the outward man, you know, perishes day by day. So the point is sickness can be a means of transition. And if you could be healed from every illness, you know, simply by having enough faith, then keep it, you know, then you would never die. According, but according to Hebrews 9 and verse 27, the Bible said God has already appointed a time that each of us will die and then uh, our lives will be judged by God. So understand that genuine faith in God always seeks harmony, you know, with God's will. And that's why when Jesus prayed, you know, he took his disciples in the garden and then took went just a little bit further, fell on the ground and said, Father, you know, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. In other words, he expressed his desire. But in in expressing that desire, he also expressed submission to the will of God to uh, do God's will. In first John five and verse four. Uh, the Bible, John says this, this is the confidence that we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So we have to recognize, you know, that illness can be in line, you know, with God's will. There are reasons why uh, some people are not everybody that we pray for on uh, don't necessarily recover. Here's the third reason that we need to understand, or the third question, and that is who can pray for, for healing? And the answer that comes out of the text is any child of God. You don't have to be some special person. You don't have to be some holy person, you know, but all you need to do is be a All you need to be is a child of God, you know, just the earnest prayer of a believing person. And that's the message of James 5, verse 16 and 17. He says the earnest prayer of a believing person is powerful and effective. And then he gives an example. He says, Elijah, he said, was a human being just like us. Yet when he prayed earnestly, 
Note what happened. You know, so the point is the most confident statement of this verse is in that phrase. Elijah was just like us. You don't have to be somebody special is what James is saying. You know, if uh, God only heard the prayers of perfect people, understand this. No prayers would ever be heard because none of us are perfect. And the Bible says, just like Elijah was a human being, just like us, you if you prayed, believing, you know, then your prayer is effectual in terms of bringing about the desired result. You know, earlier he said in the text to call the elders to pray and anoint you with all. You know, some people ask the question, well, what is the anointing, you know, with all in this text? And of course, there are several interpretations. But one thing you need to understand that James is not talking about a ritual anointing. He's not talking about the dabbing. You know, he doesn't use that word. He's talking about rubbing. Actually, the word anointing here is rubbing the person that's sick, you know, with all. And what that re reflects is in ancient culture, it was a typical way of ministering to somebody that was sick or wounded by anointing or rubbing oil, you know, on their on their bodies. When what it does do is symbolize the ministry associated, you know, with with the prayer. It is a prayer ministry of restoration. You're not just praying for the person, but you're doing for the person, doing whatever is necessary to bring comfort and encouragement to the person. You know, the other thing that one might recognize in other interpretations is that all is a symbol of the Holy Spirit and it can be a symbol of faith. It can be used, you know, as a symbol of faith. And so that there's no reason to debate this. There's nothing in scripture that will forbid you, you know, from rubbing oil or anointing a person, you know, that is sick with oil. If it if it enhances their faith, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And we don't you know, we don't if a person wants one of our elders to come and pray for them and anoint them with all that crest, that request would be honored because there's nothing unscriptural about that. You know, so need to understand what does elders, the significance of elders in this text? You know, does it simply mean that only elders can pray, you know, for healing? No. Elders represent and embody believers with confirmed faith. You know, any mature believer, sometimes a believer wants somebody, you know, that to come alongside of them, that they really believe, you know, have a relationship with God, you know, that can get a prayer through. And any mature believer can minister in this way. According to John 14, Jesus said in John 14, 12 to 13, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater works than these because I'm going to my father. I'll do whatever you ask in my name so that the son may, be, may glory, bring glory to the father. So Jesus says anyone, you know, who have faith can even do greater works. The point is, what do you mean by greater works? Not greater in terms of quality, greater in quantity. Jesus was one person while he was on earth. You know, he can only be in one place at a time. But when he went back to the Father, sent the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells in believers everywhere. And therefore, many prayers can be offered, you know, all over the world, you know, for people who may be sick. You know, so greater works in terms of quantity, not necessarily in terms of quality. Now, here's the last question. How do I pray for healing for myself and others? Now, let me tell you this. God wants you to God wants to make you a healing agent. You know, that is somebody, you know, that that prays and and bring blessings, you know, of healing and restoration to others. But you need to keep in mind three things when you want to be that kind of instrument for God. You know, the first thing that you need to be concerned about is, number one, make sure that your heart is clean from sin. You know, that is, you know, you can't harbor unconfessed sin in your life and then go out and, and claim to be praying, you know, for others. You need to, as the Bible said, confess your faults to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. James 5 and verse 16, you know, so not harboring sin in your heart enables you to be an instrument 
of effectual prayer on behalf of yourself and others. And here the second principle is be specific when you ask. You know, don't just simply go and say, okay, God, I want you to bless this person. What does that mean? You know, I pray for them. What do, what do you mean by that? Because and many people, you know, in terms of prayer, they don't want to put God in a box. Don't be afraid to put God in a box. God want you to be specific. He wants you to hold. You know, he wants you to hold him to what you are asking for so that when he answers that prayer or even goes beyond, you'll know what he has gone beyond. You will know what, you know, what God is doing, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, responding for, to your particular request. So don't pray in generalities. God wants you to pray specifically. He wants you to know what you're praying for. Here's the third thing. The Bible says, ask in faith. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt. That's why there's a prayer ministry associated, you know, with uh, healing is because you must believe what you're asking for. And therefore, you commit to ministering to that person. You commit to helping that person be restored to health and wellness. You know, and this is uh, the power associated with faith as it brings healing, you know, to the sick. Now, after every sermon, after every message, after every worship service, we ask you to do three things. Number one, we ask you to apply the principles, you know, ask God to help you apply these principles in your life, you know, and you do that through prayer. Just ask God to just help you. And then the second thing is, you know, as God is blessing you during this time, you know, of crises, uh, God wants you to be an example and he wants you to acknowledge his greatness and his goodness, you know, and so therefore whatever God is doing for you, take a token of that and worship God with it. You may offer, bring an offering, you know, in terms of you've been healed, just like the lepers when they were healed. He said, go offer, make the offering as a token of. Of, of thanksgiving in terms of what God is doing. God expects you to be grateful, you know, in terms of whatever he does in your life. If he's brought a healing in your life, then you need to be responsive to that in terms of worship. You know, and then the third thing we ask you to do, you know, is to gather with other believers on a platform, a social platform such as Zoom and discuss these principles so that you can receive of the fullness of others in applying these principles in your life. Now, if you have not yet taken the step of giving your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to uh, lead you in doing that by guiding you to take four to initiative. Number one, first admit your need for the Lord. Admit that you need him. You can't help yourself. You can't rescue yourself. You can't even heal yourself. You know, so the point is admit, admit your need for Christ in your life and then accept Christ as the one who can rescue you. He could be your savior. That's step number two. And the third thing that you need to do, you know, now when you take step number two, that's called repentance. You're not going to rely upon yourself. You're not going to claim to be self-sufficient. You're going to claim that you have a need for the Lord in your life. And then the third principle is to acknowledge him as God. You know, in other words, he's God all by himself. And that's why he he doesn't have to suspend creation and everything in order to get help to you. God can bring all the divine resources at his disposal to you in terms of bringing you to recovery. He can bring scientific advancements. He can bring hospitals. He can bring doctors, knowledgeable counselors. He can bring many resources to bear in bringing healing in your life. And that's called divine healing, faith healing. And so the point Point is, you know, ask God, uh, acknowledge Jesus as the son of God. And then finally, if you have embraced him as savior and you believe him in him as God, you know, then that must be demonstrated by acting on your faith in being baptized to receive forgiveness of sins. That is his grace in your life and also the experience of the Holy Spirit. Will you make that decision Acknowledge, uh, let the people in your Zoom know that you're wanting to make that decision and they will help you make arrangements, you know, for your obedience to Christ uh, this day. Will you bow with me in a word of prayer as we go to God in prayer, you know, for this message to be applied? Lord, we just pray, you know, that as we uh, consider the principles of this text, uh, you have helped us to understand, Father, the various conditions, you know, that should drive us to call upon you as our father. 
Uh, we realize, Father, that you that your will stands and you're sovereign. You're God all by yourself. And just because we ask doesn't mean that you that we are controlling your response. You know, that we acknowledge your will, that we want to pray in harmony, you know, with your will, not only for ourselves, but for others. And then, oh, Lord, uh, we ask you. Uh, we, we thank you and we are so grateful that you give us the privilege of being your children and to be able to call upon you as our father. We consider that a blessing in and of itself. And then finally, Lord, uh, help us and order us and teach us how, you know, that we are to pray to you. Help us to be specific and help us to pray in faith, you know, Father. Uh, and we and for all that you give us we will remember to give you the praise. In Jesus' name, we ask these favors. Amen.